I'm Zoe Delahunty Light, and I'm gonna say this right up front. There are spoilers for the entirety of Horizon Forbidden West in here. You should have really seen that coming. I've once again delved deep into the lore of Horizon Forbidden West to bring you what really happened to the Zeniths on Sirius. And if you're interested in more lore from Gorilla's Game, make sure to check out the playlist linked in the pinned comment below. There's a lot to get through, so on with the trash fire that is the rise and fall of the Zeniths. You can't talk about the Zeniths without talking about Oswald Dalgar. As the only known member of Far Zenith, which was just a think tank before the Pharaoh Plague started, he was pretty full of himself. Other members of Far Zenith preferred to stay anonymous, so nobody knew what terrible people they were for using wealth to escape Earth, but Oswald didn't have that issue. He was their PR representative, essentially, who was ever so conscious of public perception and how to twist it to their advantage. In a presentation to fully-fledged and, more importantly, paid-up Odyssey members, Oswald says that the Earth's degradation poses an unacceptable risk for the world's elite, as if the Earth is a house they can just flip. Only the wealthiest could escape on the Odyssey, and the sense of entitlement that wealth brings led the members to believe that the perilous state the Earth was in was just a road bump that they could pay to avoid. There was far more going on behind the scenes that even Oswald would ever know of, though. Far Zenith gave the ectogenic chamber technology for the Eleuthia Cradles to the Zero Dawn Project, but unbeknownst to the Zero Dawn Project, it was old tech that Far Zenith had improved upon years ago, and they ended up trading it for Apollo. The Zeniths got the better bargain and mocked Zero Dawn behind the scenes, especially as they also gave their prototype of their own Homer archive to the Zero Dawn project, which was way inferior to Apollo anyway. With the Pharaoh threat escalating, Oswald was shafted, as people who could pay the exorbitant prices took his space on the Odyssey. Far Zenith said he didn't have the skill set to justify his place on the Odyssey, which is ironic considering the lack of skills that a lot of the wealthy people have, unless, of course, you count exploiting workers. Anyway, Far Zenith then went a step further and created a digital puppet of Oswald to be used in future presentations so they didn't need him for PR. This is even darker when you consider that it's implied that Far Zenith killed him as he knew too much about the project to be left alive. We don't know how the confrontation between Oswald and his bosses went down, though having a puppet of him to use after his death feels really violating. As if they weren't being evil enough already, Far Zenith started Project Anzu, a plot to steal Gaia. They subtly approached Hank Shaw, a beta in the Hades subfunction development, and promised him premium accommodation for his birth on the Odyssey as his payment in exchange for him sending them a copy of Gaia. However, as per usual, Far Zenith aimed to remove him from the equation prior to the Odyssey's launch, so they wouldn't have fulfilled their end of the bargain yet again. Travis Tate, expert hacker, realised that the Zeniths were trying to steal Gaia through Hank Shaw, so, with Sobek's blessing, he encrypted a logic bomb into the fake Gaia model Hank sent them, which messed up the AI running the systems in the Far Zenith HQ. Serves you right. Hank got his comeuppance as well, and was presumably kicked out of Zero Dawn and sacrificed his place in Elysium. In the Far Zenith research facility, Song Zhao and her team switched their focus to work on longevity research, with the same strategy underway in the Far Zenith labs in Tokyo and Lagos. Behind the scenes, Far Zenith already had a functional immortality serum that was advanced enough to not need touch-ups as regularly as commercial products like the Rejuve gene, because immortality treatments somehow already existed in that world. Someone called Malik had a neurophysiology team working at Far Zenith 2, who were doing experiments on neurophysical capabilities. Eventually, this brain tinkering paid off, and their team created a first generation implant that would extend the lifespan of Far Zenith members and was the beginning of their immortality journey. I'm not sure what form that implant took. But considering Malik was doing neurophysiology research, I bet it was a brain implant. Biological immortality just wasn't enough for the Zeniths, though. 
and they had started to work on digital transcendence long before the Odyssey launched. According to the Far Zenith facility in Zurich, their research team had findings on something called WBE, which gave them mixed results. The team at Zurich claimed it had uncovered a couple of promising avenues, but anything bordering on real digital transcendence looks to be decades away. The Zenith's desire to achieve this digital transcendence would be their downfall. Finally, the Odyssey launched and the Zeniths left Earth and human decency behind. It would take 300 years to reach Sirius, but still, to prevent anyone following them or trying to reach out for them for something clearly alien to the Zeniths called help, they lied about the Odyssey being destroyed in orbit, faking the data so no one would come after them. Eventually, they made it to Sirius. Hooray! Upon Sirius, the Zeniths put all that research they had done on the Odyssey over 300 years to good use and built themselves a colony, the likes of which we can't fully imagine. Machines serviced their every need, and any memory or fantasy could be endlessly savoured in virtual reality, meaning the Zeniths could regress into their own minds and cease having to worry about the usual human things like money, making the most of your life, or ambition. With the physical constraints of Earth and mortality gone, they could do anything they dreamt of, but it was completely wasted on them. Languishing in luxury for centuries, the Zeniths had attained the hitherto impossible fantasy humanity had always had about immortality, and all those centuries were spent on and in virtual reality. It was one of the many means that the Zeniths could use to have anything they wanted, stagnating into comfort. Some technical achievements did mark their time on Sirius, however, like the Spectre and Fabricator technology, both of which could create anything they wanted in whatever quantity. Though considering how rich they were on Earth, this probably wasn't anything new to them. White and gold became their architecture of choice, and instead of being metal or mortar, judging from their outpost on Earth, it looks like their buildings were grown rather than built, leading me to suspect that the Zeniths developed a self-building structure. Look around where Aloy finds Beta, and you'll see their baroque leanings when it comes to furniture, showing how far their delusions of grandeur stretch, but also how surprisingly unimaginative they are, aping humanity's old designs instead of coming up with something new. Once again, wasted potential here. Interior design related, but still. Aside from interior design, Zeniths also made advancements in technology too, shunning tablets to store data and instead using these spherical devices and programs that could plug into people's consciousnesses like they did to poor Beta here. Tilda herself says the Zeniths lived in what was effectively a pampered dream state, and from everything I've explained here, I hope you agree with me that yup, she's sure right about that. Tilda, however, withdrew to be alone more and more, pondering her mistakes in letting Elizabeth die on Earth and letting those regrets consume her, turning her into the possessive, controlling woman we meet in the finale of Horizon Forbidden West. So, you know what the Zenith world was like, but what about the Zeniths themselves? We only know of a handful of them, so it's my displeasure to introduce you to these terrible, terrible specimens. This is Gerard Bieri. Gerard, Jeff, sound similar, don't they? Look similar too. Gerard, anyway, was the head of the world's largest financial conglomerate and therefore, one of the wealthiest people on Earth, and certainly the wealthiest among the Zeniths. Incredibly, he thinks he's a refined patrician and leader of the Zeniths, in control with what he thinks is a disarming smile, but who does he think he's fooling? Gerard is cold and calculating, as shown by the fact that he was the one who decided to restrict Beta's upbringing to certain subjects and topics, and keeping her imprisoned all while painting himself and the other Zeniths as her benefactors. Eric Visser is the most comically evil one, whose mummy never gave him enough hugs. This violent husk of a man founded a private military called First Imperator when he lived on Earth, comprised entirely of specialised operatives, all of them human, 
in a time when robot ruled the military industry. Tilda says he tailored these private militaries to clients who preferred a personal touch, whatever the hell that means. Rumours spread that Eric took part in hunts, personally killing targets purely for the thrill of it. Spending centuries killing people in VR on Sirius twisted Eric's already therapy bait personality into something even more disturbed, as he went on violent rampage after rampage with diminishing satisfaction as he got too used to the act of bloody murder. Of course, there's also Tilda. The programmer, art dealer, and eventual spy slash information trader earned her wealth through the programs she developed to spot art forgeries which eventually spiralled out into the intelligence sector. An orphan to climate change, Tilda had always been alone, and claims she was lured to become part of Far Zenith by the idea of being in a society full of geniuses and those at the top of their field. Whether this is true, or whether she joined to simply and selfishly save her own life at the expense of the rest of Earth, we'll never really know. Ah yes, Verbena Sutter. She inherited billions from her father's luxury hollow tourism company, and became one of the richest people in the world at just 24 years old. Without needing to work, Verbena became, essentially, an influencer. Ruthless, entitled, and cruel, Verbena was engaged 17 times on Earth, but was a controlling partner. Upon becoming engaged to her latest partner, she demanded that he change how his own apartment was outfitted. That's all we know about her, but trust me, She's the worst. Stanley Chen, builder of the holographic marvel of Las Vegas, was an optimist and one of the good ones. Missing his beloved city, which he couldn't bear to shut down completely when he is preparing to board the Odyssey, Chen built an exact replica of Las Vegas in VR on Sirius and let anyone visit it when they wished. This was unlike the other Zeniths who kept their fantasies and custom worlds private, hoarding their luxury. Sadly, Chen didn't make it to the ship when Sirius fell. I wish he had. Then there's the ones we don't know a lot about. Anika Majani, a dancer who founded the most successful dance channel on the future version of the internet. Song Zhao, who worked in cellular biology and devised the Zenith's immortality treatments. And finally, Devin Miller, the CEO of a fast food corporation whose only real preoccupations were perfecting his golf swing and taking selfies. Walla guy. Tilda claims she didn't understand how greedy the other Zeniths were, but she turned out to be ruthless, so this could be her lying to make herself look better in Aloy's eyes and absolve herself of any greed or selfish acts she might have carried out on Sirius. Peter Shivumbe, the founder of Far Zenith, isn't mentioned much in Horizon Forbidden West, but it was him who came up with the idea for what would eventually snowball into Nemesis. He backed a project that explored an ambitious series of consciousness upload experiments when he was alive on Earth, having died way before the Odyssey launched. In his own words, he believed in the immortality of the human spirit, and the logical next step is the immortality of the human mind. His face is never shown to us in Forbidden West, so you might want to put a pin in that supposed death of his, and remember his name, Peter Shivumbe. Attaining biological immortality wasn't enough for the Zeniths. They lusted after that digital transcendence that Peter Shivumbe chased, desiring the ability to move their consciousnesses into any object imaginable, and that lust caused their downfall. Using the consciousnesses of the participating Zeniths, they uploaded all of these memories, prejudices, and personalities into a vessel and experimented with uploading it to different objects. It ultimately failed, but the Zeniths, never one to do something so menial as to clean up after themselves, didn't finish the job. This mess of minds was left to fester in containment for decades, and eventually became sentient. It broke out, hacked into the Zenith colony using the memories it had of passcodes, security systems, blueprints, and everything, and destroyed the entire settlement in hours. A handful of Zeniths were able to flee on board the Odyssey, and they named the executor of their doom Nemesis. The plan was to go to Earth, pick up Gaia, and flee to a random planet in a different system where Nemesis couldn't find them. However, the dummies forgot that Nemesis is essentially them, meaning it predicted exactly where they would go. It was the one who sent the signal to Hades to wake it up and destroy the Earth, so its creators would arrive to a barren Earth they couldn't escape. However, upon Hades failing due to Gaia's self-destruction, Nemesis launched itself into space after the Zeniths, 
chasing them down on their way to Earth to personally exact its revenge. Can't really blame it. On the Odyssey, once again, the Zeniths created a clone of Elizabeth Sobek to act as a key to open all of the gene locked doors they'd need to get to Gaia. She was named Beta, an insulting choice to be honest, as Sobek was Alpha Prime, inferring that Beta is the inferior second model and also not giving her any identity beyond her connection to Zobek. During her time on the Odyssey, Beta was tutored in physics and science by Apollo, ensuring the Zeniths could utilize Zobek's intelligence should they need it. To them, she was just a tool. However, Tilda was a bit softer and yet also more selfish than the other Zeniths. Her and Zobek had been in a relationship before everything fell apart, and Tilda saw a shadow of her old lover in Beta. Wanting to reclaim that time she used to spend with Elizabeth, Tilda started to secretly educate Beta on the arts in her own private channel, hidden from the others. Soon, it became too dangerous and Tilda had to stop before the other Zeniths realised what she was doing, abruptly ending their hidden calls without any warning. This sudden coldness would affect Beta for the rest of her life. Over 17 long years, the Odyssey got closer and closer to Earth, and all that time, Tilda was working on something new. This is a theory I have, as I think Tilda secretly built Spectre Prime, the suit she would eventually wear in her final confrontation with Aloy. Signs that she worked on it solo are abundant, as none of the other Zeniths summoned it to use in that final battle, which they surely would have done had they known it existed, especially as their shields were destroyed by Silence. Little did Tilda know that she'd come to use Spectre Prime against another clone of Sobek, and that underestimating that clone, just like she underestimated Beta, would end up killing her. And that's the rise and fall of the Zeniths, the second instalment of my Horizon Forbidden West lore series. I'm going to cover the events of their landing on Earth in another video about the story of Horizon Forbidden West. So until then, do you have any other characters, events or tribes that you're curious about and would like me to cover? Let me know in the comments below. If you enjoyed the video, thanks very much and don't forget to like and subscribe to Eurogamer as we have a new video out every single day. Now I'm going to go and look at Baroque interior design and feel smug that I can already think of ways I'd improve upon it unlike the Zeniths. So, I'll see you next time.